All right, I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, we were looked last week and looking at the signs of sonship. I'd like to read the text again, and we looked at two of the evidences or two of the signs given in this text of, of sonship, and this morning we're going to continue on that theme, but I'd like to read the text and ask the Lord's uh, blessing on our service again. Um, but again in verse 14, read the whole context. He said, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy, not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and to obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Let's pray. Father, I do come this morning and confess great need, Lord. We need you to work in each heart and each life. You know the condition of each heart before you, you know the life that's being lived, you know uh, the reality of the relationships that are here today in terms of relationships of genuine saving faith or mere profession, Lord, you know who your children are and you really do not want your children to be confused about that issue. And I pray this morning as we look at this text that your spirit will have free course over all that is said, that Christ will be exalted, the Lord will be humbled before thee that we'll be recipients of grace, eager to hear, but not just to hear, but to live out the truth of your word. For those that are here without Christ, we pray that you would be gracious this morning, open their eyes to behold the majesty, the glory of Jesus Christ, to understand our desperate need of a Savior, to understand their desperate condition in sin. And today, Lord, that some here would be rescued from slavery of sin and become the very children of God. And then for each one, Lord, that is here as your child, there would be a greater understanding of, of, of the beauty of that, the glory of that, of the coming glory, and Lord, then a greater apprehension of what it means to live for you and even to suffer for you. Lord, suffering is not a topic we like to talk about, but Lord, it's a growing reality in a day that we live. The children of God are going to stand apart from the children of darkness, and the greater the darkness grows in our country, the greater the persecution will grow on the children of God. So, Lord, help us to grow in our love and apprehension of you, that we may be prepared by your Spirit through your word to stand in an evil day, and having done all, that we may stand, that Christ may be glorified. And we'll be careful to give you the glory, if it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm very thankful for the group of men that are coming out on Thursday nights, and we've been uh, diving into some very important issues, issues around the heart, and issues around a culture that has gone uh, crazy in a couple of very vital issues, all right? And uh, one of the questions we peered into is this whole issue of, of why do we do what we do? And we're, we're talking about that. Why do we do the things that we do? And, and it's such a vital issue because when we look at the scriptures, we're confronted by the reality that David was called a man after God's own heart. Solomon, when, when God came to Solomon and said, what will I give you? What would you ask of me? God, Solomon asked for wisdom, and he was then said to be the wisest man to ever live, yet both David and Solomon fell in the area of sexual temptation. A man after God's own heart, and the wisest man ever to live, both failed in those areas. They both also failed in the area of how they managed their finances and what they spent money on. Both of them failed in those areas. So they're huge issues. We live in a culture in those, both those two categories as as the author of the book puts it, has gone crazy. And we do live in a culture that doesn't think biblically about those issues. And, and you say, well, what, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? Well, I think everything. 
Because the question we're talking about is whose child are you? And how you make decisions in regard to sexual temptation, how you make decisions in regard to how you manage or spend money is a reflection of your relationship with God. It's a revelation of whose child you are. Because as we looked last week, as the Bible's very clear, it says those who are the sons of God or the children of God are led by the Spirit of God. You know one of the things the Spirit can never lead you to do? Sin. Not a chance. Can't lead you to misuse your money. Won't happen. Cannot lead you to violate your sexual purity. Will not happen. The Spirit of God will never direct you contrary to God. He cannot because he is God himself. And all of those who are the children of God have been indwelled by the Spirit of God and will reflect that in even those very areas of life. We have a good group of men that are studying through the Gospel of John. We stay late on Thursday night. I commend them. They come Thursday. They come to men's Bible study. We stick around. Uh, we were studying the Gospel of John. They're preparing to teach and preach. And we've been looking at the first 18 verses of John's Gospel, which lays a whole foundation to the Gospel of John and really declares Christ in, in a, such a beautiful way. We had a great conversation tied into the very topic we're talking about. And I asked them in, in this week, and as Steve mentioned, we have Chuck's funeral this coming Saturday. We're expecting somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 people to be in attendance. Uh, there's a number of those folks who are going to come who need to be saved. There's also a number of those folks who are going to come who need to be saved, who if you ask them the question, if they're God's child, they would tell you yes. I, I have preached a number of funerals in my ministry, and one of the things that always breaks my heart is to share the gospel with people only afterwards to hear them tell me and you can almost tell it sometimes as you're preaching the gospel as they just tune out because they don't need the gospel because in their minds it's something they took care of a long time ago because then they were a child in Sunday school they prayed with somebody who told them they were going to go to heaven and they never had to worry about it again they went to a church somewhere who told them that if they did some religious thing whether it was a baptism or take element or have some experience that if they did that they were going to go to heaven they never had to worry about it again and so as you share the gospel with people whose lives are being lived absolutely in contrary to the gospel, what do I mean by that? I mean, they're living their lives every day like God really is not that relevant. I mean, there's no real heart of worship. There's no digging in the word. There's no real wrestling with what pleases God and what's not. It's kind of like the idea that, look, I got my ticket punch to heaven. I'm on my way to heaven. I did that religious thing somebody told me to do, so I'm okay, so the gospel doesn't apply to me. That breaks my heart. Because I find more and more people that I talk to today in our country, there's two things I find. One, there's more and more people who are just biblically illiterate. They don't know what the Bible actually says about much of anything. And there's a whole lot of people who are convinced they're going to heaven and they have no biblical basis for that assurance. They have no biblical grounds to make that claim. There's nothing in the Bible that they've, they, they, they could hang their hat on to say, yes, I'm a child of God. Paul, as he wrote to the Corinthians, and the reason that text is up there is because Paul, after writing one letter to the Corinthians, had him come back and write to them again. Remember, he spent a year and a half in Corinth. He spent a long time in Corinth, and, uh, and he saw a church planted, but then after you know, his absence, there's all these difficulties that rose up in Corinth, and there's divisions, there's all these things happening. By the time Paul gets to the end of 2 Corinthians, he's telling the church in Corinth, you better stop and examine the evidence. And see whether you're really in the faith, because if Christ is not in you, then you don't belong to Christ. And so you can have professed to have believed something, but there's difference between professing, so he says, test yourself. See that you pass the test. And so you ask, well, how do we do that? I am so glad you asked the question. Because that's exactly what we're talking about in Romans chapter 8. How do you do this? Examine yourselves. See whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. In Romans chapter 8, we've looked at two of the signs of sonship. And as we continue this study this morning, then I ask you to examine the evidence. And how do you answer that question if you were to face your physical death 
and God, and, and folks, this is hypothetical, all right? You die, you go, you're not going to a pearly gate, and someone's coming out and saying, why should I let you in? That's not going to happen. If you do not know Christ, you will immediately be in hell forever. No second chances. If you know Christ, you'll immediately be in the presence of God forever. But the question, the hypothetical question, the point of it isn't so that you think that I die, I get to come up with a good answer, and if I get the answer right, I get in. That's not the point of the illustration. The point of the question is to make you stop and answer now, what basis do you rest in that you're a child of God? And is that basis found in the Word of God? Because if it's not, then you have no biblical hope. Biblical hope is always found in the Word of God. And so as we look, we're looking at the source of biblical hope. We're looking at the evidences that there is, that I am God's child, that you are God's child. And, and as we find and we see the evidences of grace in our life, then we should be filled with thanksgiving for the indescribable gift of eternal life. And if we do not find the evidence is compelling and our hearts are filled with doubt, then we should pray that God would grant us grace, that we would do one of two things, either stop grieving the spirit whereby we are filled with doubt because of sin in our life, or that God would grant us grace and bring us to true repentance and faith. The signs of sonship, as we've talked about, and we simply looked at the take me to your leader. I hope there was a fruitful discussion. Appreciate the participation, if you, and I appreciate Pastor Ted's commercial this morning. All right? It's a good commercial, and it's not a commercial like the world has given it. Folks, we need to interact with truth. We need to talk about these things and, 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 and hear because one of the great dangers is always, listen, we live in an information age. You're overloaded with information. And if you treat church just like another informational time, so we come and gather all this information, but we don't actually live it out, then we are just falling under the condemnation of James. James says, be eager to hear, but don't be, don't be hearers only. Because the people who simply gather in God's presence and hear from God and go out and continue to live life like it didn't matter what God said, deceive themselves about what? Their relationship with God. That's what James said. So if we are comfortable to come and hear information and we don't ever live it out, then we have a self-deceived relationship with God. And so our goal is to, to really demonstrate tangibly in life that we are following the Spirit's leadership in our life, that then the evidence, as we talked about even in Sunday school today, is the, the actions and responses. And this is a convicting truth, folks. The fruit of the Spirit, we, we've, we've all read this text before, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, uh, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I mean, that reality is, as I go down that list, is, is this week and this past week, in various circumstances and situations, I responded to promptings of all kinds, some that were favorable, some that weren't. And was my response one that looks like this? Because in every way my responses didn't look like this, that was not the spirit, but my own sinful flesh that was showing itself. And you know what? God is such a gracious father. He is a better father than I've ever been. And God always works in my life and puts me in those situations to get me to see some of the ways that this stuff, the spirit's not really leading where the flesh is still winning a battle. And God's doing that in our life so that we would yield to the Spirit, confess sin, turn from sin. That's why confession's an ongoing reality. Folks, if you can tell me, and you're all honesty, can say this week in every response that I had to people and circumstances, it looked like the fruit of the Spirit, then you should be in heaven. Or you're really good at telling yourself stories. You know, because we fail and we're being confronted by those failures. Now, we don't like that. I mean, rather, you know, not admit that I fail. But that's why confession is an ongoing part of the Christian life. That I come to my father and I say, Father, forgive me. 
Good news of being a child of God is Jesus Christ paid for all those failures I had this past week, didn't he? All those failures I had this past week, Christ died for those. And he's invited me to come and experience forgiveness and cleansing. And he wants me to yield this week more to the Spirit so that some of those failures of last week don't happen again this week. And that's how I grow. And so that's how I'm led by the Spirit of God. And then we looked at the dependency. And, and this is a great fight that we all face because we all want to be sufficient. We all want to, 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 to run life, so to speak, on our own accord. But the Spirit of God, has, we've received a spirit of adoption. And through the spirit of adoption, we begin to cry out to God. And I love the language. We cry, Abba, Father. I didn't, I, I didn't touch on this last week. But to the word Abba is, is, is an Aramaic term. And it is a term of endearment. It, wasn't, it was a term of a, of a child to their father. Okay? It wasn't a formal term. So I don't know, when your kids grew up, what they call you? Daddy, what, somebody else? Papa? Okay, a term of endearment. That's really what this term is. Now, who used the term Abba? Jesus did. Jesus used the term Abba in reference of his relationship to the father. And so here's what he's saying, and it's profound. This is not just a little deal. He is saying, as the Spirit of God is at work in your heart, you are, your heart is going to cry out, like Jesus, that God is your Father. There's that kind of relationship between you and the Father, that it is a relationship not uh, of just, hey, I come to church and I, and I, and I bow in prayer here and there. There's a, a close relationship between the Son and the Father. And so I become a child of God. The Spirit of God dwells in me so that now my heart is crying out in dependence to my Father. God is not distant. He is with me. And he is guiding and directing via the spirit that lives inside of me through a word that he has given to me. He is a father who infinitely cares for me. Folks, if I don't believe that, then I face the trials of living in a fallen world without a lot of hope. I face the reality that I live in a fallen world and a fallen body, and as we're going to get into the text, as, as all of creation has been subjected to the curse, and we live in that kind of world. And, and how you respond to those circumstances. Because you don't go through a week without that facing that reality. Two, several realities of that fallen world. One, that you're still a sinner struggling with sin. You don't go through a week without facing that reality. You don't go through a week without facing the reality. Not only you are a sinner who struggles with sin, but you're a sinner who dwells with other sinners who are struggling with sin. And then you struggle to respond to them when they sin. You struggle in how to say the right thing or how not to sin in response back. And we struggle every day, I mean every week, every day of our life with those realities. We are still sinners who struggle against sin. We live with other sinners who are struggling with sin. And we live in a fallen world where things simply don't work like they were intended to. How do we respond to that? Well, the children of God cry out to their father because they know this. Their father's in control, and their father's good. You can't believe otherwise about God if the Spirit of God is the one testifying to you, can you? Do you think the Spirit of God is going to cause you to doubt God's goodness? Do you think the Spirit of God is going to say, hey, wait a minute, I don't know if you can really trust God in that circumstance you're facing today. You know that difficulty that came up when you're just scratching your head and saying, why am I here now and what is this all about? Do you think the Spirit of God's going to minister to you and say, well, you better take care of this yourself. You can't trust God. The Spirit of God ministers in the hearts of the children of God to assure us that God is our Father. And if He is our Father, we know that God is good and He is in control and He can be depended on. So when I ask you who you depend on, it is a big question. It is a loaded question. As you face the difficulties of living in a fallen world, what is your response? Can we, even as Steve prayed today, thank God in every circumstance of life? Because if we can't, then we're doubting the goodness of God. Right? Right? This is the will of God for you, that we should rejoice always, pray without ceasing, 
and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And everything. How can I do that? By the Spirit. We move on to the, probably one of the toughest realities. How do I know I'm a child of God? Well, I just ask you the question. Tell me about your suffering. Tell me where in life you're experiencing suffering. Tell me how you respond to suffering. And as you tell me about where you're suffering, why you're suffering, and how you respond to suffering, you're going to open a window up into your relationship with God. And if you don't understand that, you don't understand suffering. There's not anyone in this room that doesn't experience suffering. Now, sometimes we experience it because of our sin, and we should, right? Sometimes we experience it because of other people's sin, and we wish we didn't. Sometimes we experience it because we're simply doing the right thing, and the right thing is not honored in our society anymore. Sometimes we experience suffering just because we live in a fallen world, and, and difficult circumstances come, and difficult storms come, cancer comes, all kinds of things come, people die. We face suffering as just part of living in a fallen world. We cannot avoid suffering. So contrary to the American idol of comfort and ease, two of the American idols, if you believe those American idols, you will organize your life to avoid difficulties, which means you're constantly going to be running from where God would have you to be. You live in a fallen world in which God has not called you to avoid suffering. We look at this text and we'll walk through it. He says, if children then heirs, and heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided, and note how he puts it, okay? Because listen, if you're always trying to avoid suffering, then you've got to deal with this text, don't you? If you're always saying suffering's bad to be avoided, I've got to get out of it, I don't want to be in a place of difficulty, don't put me there, I'm not going there, here's what the Bible says. Now, it's not what I say, it's what the Bible says. This is what God says about being his child. If you're an heir of God, provided you what? Suffer with him. And if we don't suffer with him, then we are not children. That's what the text is saying. Provided we suffer with him in order we may be glorified with him. For I consider the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so Paul joins together both the, 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 the rewards of sonship, we're heirs, fellow heirs with Christ, which is an amazing statement. I mean, the reality is I'm inheriting a kingdom of God in which Christ is going to rule and reign forever. And I'm going to walk into this kingdom in which sin will never again be a part, which pain and suffering will never again exist. I, I mean, it's an incredible thing to be an heir of God, a co-heir with Christ. It is beyond your ability to fully fathom, but it is one that needs to capture your attention or you will never get to the reality of verse 18. You'll never live in that reality. You will never live out, I consider, I count, I reckon, I count on the ledger page of my life. There is not one thing I've ever suffered that compares with the glory that is soon to be revealed and will be enjoyed forever. Nothing compares to that. You'll never get to verse 18 unless you understand the blessing it is to be an heir with Christ. Provided we suffer with him comes to the price. And so we have a lot of gospel messages today that are all about all the, you know, it's all about you. It's all about you being rescued, all about your best life, all about all the things Jesus can do for you. Can I tell you this, that the gospel message confronts you and I with the responsibility to submit our hearts to Christ and follow him, which includes down a pathway of suffering? And American Christians need to get this one right. Because if we do not get this one right, and, and the reality is, is the increased level of persecution is coming in this country, okay? I'm not just trying to be a bearer, pessimist, or, or anything. Listen, we've lived for a long time in a culture that's honored biblical Judeo-Christian ethics. That is not our day anymore. You do not live in a nation that's built itself. I mean, you live in a nation that's foundation was Christian ethics, but it no longer holds those ethics. Just look at public policy. You do not live in a nation that holds biblical values and biblical ethics any longer. It is a different country. 
with a different value system. To put it as Kevin Bowder in an article he wrote called Paradigm Shift puts it, we've moved from a daytime paradigm in which people's lives were shaped by a biblical worldview or at least a morality view of what is virtuous and what is not to a darkness paradigm. You do not live in a culture that shares biblical virtue. You don't believe it? Go in the workplace and start talking about homosexuality being a sin. Is it a sin? So talk about it. Well, I can't. I'll be called a homophobe. I might lose my job. You do not live. You do not live in a culture that any longer has biblical virtue as a core belief. It is actually absolutely contrary to that. And if you bought in and see, this is one of the difficulties in American culture, all right? This is one of the things I've wrestled with a long time. Uh, and I, I don't mean to put, when my kids were in children's church or in, uh, in, they go to, let's say, our Wednesday night program and things like that, a lot of times afterwards, the first question you want to ask them or they go to, you know, VBS and they come home and you ask them the question, did you have fun? Did you have fun today? Was church fun today? Was it fun? Where did we learn that? We learned that from Disneyland. We've learned it from the culture around us that everything's supposed to be fun. We went and had fun. Wasn't it fun? Well, I have news for you. You live in a culture that does not hold biblical virtue any longer. It's not going to be fun to be a Christian in that culture. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. It's going to be a price to be paid. It's going to be a stand to be taken. It's going to cost you friendships. It's going to cost you jobs. It's going to cost to stand for Christ. If we're teaching our children and we're teaching ourselves that it's all about fun, they're going to abandon the faith because they never really even had it. Because they were taught faith is all about fun. Faith isn't about fun. Faith is about Christ. Christ walked a road of suffering, didn't he? You know, Christ didn't come and say, hey, follow me, and we're just going to go have a party over here in this city, and then one over in that city, and did you guys have fun following me today? Wasn't it fun following me? You guys didn't have fun? Oh, we better change the message. I'm sorry it wasn't fun for you. Jesus didn't come preaching a message of fun. He preached a message of repent, turn from sin, or be destroyed, and that's forever. And he preached a message that you have to come and follow me. And in fact, he preached a message that said, if you count your life dear to yourself, and you're going to save your life in this culture, and you're going to live for you in this culture, you're going to die forever. But when you die to yourself, and you lose your life in this culture, meaning you're willing to suffer for Christ, and you lose it, you're going to gain eternity. We live in a culture that does not, I mean, we, we, we live in this day. And we live in a time in which we're facing an increasing amount of darkness and the world and the devil are going to tempt your flesh constantly to compromise. Constantly. Listen, your flesh is a compromiser. You know that, right? So built-in reality, when you walk out of church, and even while you're in church, to be quite frank with you, I mean, you're tempted to turn me off. Okay? I'm worthy of turning off. Okay? Believe me, I am. But the Spirit of God isn't. So let him take the word and speak to your heart. Because you need to hear from God today. Because if you don't hear from God today, your life is on the line. And we don't treat church that way. Churches just come to have fun. No, church is to save my life. Because I've come here as a sinner who needs to hear from God. And if I don't hear from God today, I'm going to go out in this world and make decisions that are going to be costly. And I'm going to bow to this flesh, and this flesh is a traitor. And this flesh will bow to sin all the time. And I live in a culture that values sin, doesn't it? It marks it. It makes it look fun. It makes it look entertaining. And the world wants to snuff out the light. You know what Jesus said, right? You don't take your light and put it under a bushel. The culture wants to constantly shove you and offer these temporal pleasures and say, take your light and put it under the basket of sin because we don't want you to shine here. We live in a culture today in American Christianity where we've been taught for a, cent, for, for a long time now in America that the way we reach people has become more like them. And, and the more we look like, the less offensive we are to our culture, the more we're going to have an audience with our culture. That is not true. People hate the light. Get 
used to it. God hasn't called you to make the light more appealing to people who hate it. He's called you to be a light in a dark world, and the world hates the light. And the only reason they'll stop hating the light is when God opens their eyes to see it. God has not called us to become increasingly like this culture. The world's going to constantly tempt you. I mean, that's why we get told, you know, hey, if it doesn't hurt anybody, it's okay, right? We're told, hey, if it makes you happy, makes you feel good, makes you feel spiritual, I mean, we'll put it in the religious context, if it makes you feel spiritual, it must be good. Really? Your sin, your flesh, is inherently self-deceived, and you will call evil good every day by your flesh. Your flesh cannot discern evil from good and evil. Your flesh only calls evil good. That's the nature of your flesh. It's the nature of my flesh. That's why it's a flesh-spirit warfare. That's why I'm called to live under the leadership of the Spirit, because the Spirit cannot call evil good. The Spirit can't do that. Why? He's God. He's not confused. My flesh isn't confused either. It just prefers evil. And yours does too. And if you don't know that, then you walk out into this world that constantly markets to you evil as good, and you begin to call evil good. I.e., today in America, we're not sure if a man or woman is supposed, marriage is supposed to be one man or one woman. We're not sure about that anymore in America. We're not sure whether a pastor should be a man, a woman, or an it. Whatever that is. I mean, you, you, we're not sure whether, you know, who's supposed to lead and who's supposed to lead in the family. And, and we're not sure whether what our value systems should be. We're, we're not sure. I mean, everything's up for grabs in America today because it's all about you. And if it works for you, then it works for you. That's not truth, folks. You don't find that in the Bible anywhere. God did not say, hey, you get to decide for yourself what's good and what's bad. Excuse me, I'll get off the throne for you. Did you have fun? Our response to suffering is a revelation of our relationship with God. I made this statement. I, I like it. Maybe it doesn't, you know, analogies don't always work all the way, so don't think, overthink this. But, folks, when you go fishing, expect a few shark attacks. It's not always going to be fun. God's called you to get out there and fish for men. And you know, along the way, there's a lot of sharks out there. And they aren't going to like the fact that you're out there fishing for men. In Acts chapter 5, I mean, this is not the first time the apostles were hauled in. You know, they're, they're preaching the gospel of Jesus. I mean, you think about it. The religious leaders in Israel, I mean, they've crucified Christ. I mean, their troublemakers, their troubles are gone, right? We did away with that guy. He's the leader of this group. We're crucifying him. Now he rises from the dead and they're left scrambling and they, get, they pay off soldiers to lie and say, hey, we can cover this up. Just go lie and tell everybody that they stole the body. We'll be good, because this is just a small band following this guy. We can, we can handle it. The apostles go start preaching the gospel, and people are getting saved, and they're dragging these apostles into court, and what are they telling them? You've got to stop preaching in his name. And they're like, uh, no, we don't. Well, the first time they threaten them. The second time they don't threaten them. They beat them. Right? Look at the text. It says, and when they called the apostles, they beat them. This wasn't like a little just smack on the head. You're talking like rods, you know, 30 rods minus one. So 29 whacks with a rod. Anybody want to volunteer? I, I played baseball for years. I'll bring my bat in, and we can have a little rod session. See how well you walk out of that session. 30 times beaten with rods. They charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Okay, they weren't just a little sore. They were beaten. They were bruised. Their body was hurt severely. And they walked out, and when they left the presence of the council, look what they're doing. Rejoicing, they were counted worthy to suffer. We don't think that way. We don't think that way in America. We haven't been taught to think that way. I mean, I have to confess, I've lived in this culture long enough. This culture has taught me not to value suffering. This culture has taught me to value comfort and to move my life towards comfort. It has not taught me to rejoice in an opportunity to suffer. I've sought to avoid suffering. What about you? 
It's my general direction in life. I move to my easy chair. That's why we have them. You know, we got rid of the hard box. We got rid of that chair that was uncomfortable. We got rid of pews so it'd be more comfortable. We don't like discomfort. We move to comfort all the time, and the paradigm of this thing is I, I move that way. That's what my culture's taught me. And I want to be comfortable. What's wrong with comfort? Because when I'm called to suffer, I'm not going to do this. Because I make comfort of God in my life, and then when it's time to suffer for Christ, I'm, I'm not so sure I'm ready. And if I have to suffer for Christ, I don't walk home and rejoice. You know, you stand up and start sharing Christ with people, you know what? They're going to pay attention to that. They're not always going to like it. And in fact, they're going to retaliate at times. And the and, and reality is, is their ability to retaliate is simply growing in our culture. The cost of standing for Christ is going to get higher. And if I don't think this way, then when the possibility of suffering for standing for Christ comes, what am I going to do? I'm going to bow. Not to the spirit, but to my flesh. Because my flesh says, comfort first, Billy. Comfort, is it fun? Oh, no, being beat with rods. I don't think that would qualify as fun in my book. But am I ready to rejoice because I've been counted worthy to suffer because I belong to Christ? Aren't you glad Jesus didn't look at the cross and say, you know what, that doesn't look fun to me? In fact, Jerry, uh, Jerry's not here. He and his wife Melody on an anniversary trip. But Jerry's mentee, and I appreciate our folks working with mentees, and Jerry's had great opportunities. His mentee's interest in the Bible, so he's doing a Bible study with him. And he's been going through various passages of Scripture, and the mentee asked him this question of the day. He said, he goes, I watched this video that was on the crucifixion of Christ and that horrible suffering. Do you think that was fairly accurate? Jerry said, probably didn't even deal, deal justice with the magnitude of Christ's suffering. And he said, well, could he have avoided it? And that's a yes-no question. It's a yes he could have in that he had the power to avoid it. But he did not have the will to avoid it. I don't know about you, that, 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 I just stop right there. He went through that magnitude of suffering for my sin, and he had the power to say no. Right? He could have called 10,000 angels. And that's not just song stuff. He had the authority to call the host of heaven to unveil the wrath of God against men at that moment and stop the whole process and say, you're not worth it. But he didn't. Because his will was to rejoice in suffering. That he might redeem sinners like you and I out of a world filled with death and sin and make us the children of God. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't choose fun? Folks, we, we need to be preparing, increasingly preparing our heart for this reality. You and I are going to be called on again and again, more and more, more and more every day to stand for Christ and be willing to pay a cost for doing so. I mean, you know, the Syrian Christians today right now are being targeted. And you can go watch the videos of them being strung up and slaughtered in Syria today. And they're being told, deny Christ, convert and become a Muslim today or die. You know what they're doing? They're dying. And you think that won't ever happen here? You think that's not going to ever happen to you? Then you don't think very biblically, do you? We've been called to walk a pathway of suffering. Jesus Christ walked a pathway of suffering. And I've been called to treasure Christ more than I treasure my life. Aren't you thankful those Syrian Christians are saying, Jesus Christ is worth more than my physical life? You know what? They're being led by the Spirit. How do they do it? They have such courage and they're so strong. No, they have the Spirit of God dwelling in them. 
And the Spirit of God is ministering courage in their hearts. And they're standing there under that threat of not just threat, their life to be slain or they're going to deny Christ. And they're saying, I can't deny Christ because he is worthy of my life. You go in the workplace and somebody asks you a religious question. How do you respond? Religious topic comes up and you hear people blaspheming God. How do you respond? You step into that conversation and say, wait a minute, here's what Jesus said. This is who Jesus is. You're not going to talk that way about my God. You say, well, if I do that, they're going to hate me. You're right, they are. Join the club. The right club, not the wrong one. The approval of men club is not the one you want to belong to. The people who join the approval of men club go to hell. Because they're not the children of God. The people who live in the Stand for Christ club are the people who suffer and rejoice because they're counted worthy of Christ. I know that's not a feel-good message today. That's not one of those you're going to walk out of here and say, boy, I can't wait to share that sermon with everybody. They're going to love it. But I just ask you to look at the scriptures and tell me if this is not what the scriptures say. If you and I are not ready to stand for Christ, then do we really value him? You know, I mean, I use this little bit. Obviously, you guys know, this is my wife. And if one of you want to come up after service and accost her, I will show you how much I value my wife. And if I didn't do that, you would say, what's wrong with you? That's your wife. Why would you let somebody treat her like that? That's your Savior who died on a cross of Calvary for you. Why would you stand silent and let people talk about him like that? It is that personal, isn't it? It should be more personal than that. The fact of the matter is if I don't love Christ more than I love this woman right here, then I don't love Christ. Are we ready to stand? We're not living in a culture that teaches us to stand. We're living in a culture that pushes us into compromise. So look like the world, buy into the pleasures of the world, and you put the light under a barrel of sin. And the world doesn't mind that kind of Christianity. The kind of Christianity that wants to buddy up with the world and make the world feel comfortable, the world's good with that. It doesn't hate that. No light shining there. And in the world, if you, will not, if you will not buddy up with the world so that it, you, you actually take a stand against it, then the world's going to try and push you and bully you into silence or isolation. Folks, when I tell you the world is going to hate the light, I'm not telling you hide from the world. You know, when they got beaten and they left, they didn't go hide in a corner. They went right back into the synagogue and preached. In fact, they were, you can read a little bit later, they're locked up and they're told that, you know, don't do this again. And, they're, and they're, they, they, the soldiers come back and they're not in the prison because God let them out. And they're like, well, where are these guys? We're right back in the synagogue preaching. Why? Because God didn't call us to hide from the world. God didn't call us to make friends with the world. In fact, we know to be friends with the world is to be the enemy of God. So God hasn't called us to isolate So don't let the world push you away from them in the sense of being willing to engage them with the gospel. Recognize who you stand for. We've been called to make the worth of Christ known to a world. I make the worth of Christ known to the world when I stand for Christ against them. And then I stand for Christ with them and share the love of God for them. Because Jesus died for them too, didn't he? And when they see somebody who really values Christ rather than values them, some of them are going to see the light shine from your life and they're going to glorify your Father and they're going to get saved. Because they saw the difference. And God's going to use that light 
as a testimony in their life and use it to open their eyes to the value of Christ. This Jesus must mean something when people are willing to give their lives for him. This Jesus must mean something when people are willing to lose their jobs for him. This Jesus must mean something when that student is willing to take his Bible into class and say, I'll not put it down. Kick me out. Go ahead. This Jesus must mean something when we're willing to pray and pray not just some generic father or eternal spirit, but pray to the Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on a cross of Calvary, who is the only name under heaven whereby men must be saved. This Jesus will be made to mean something to a world when he actually means something to the children of God. So we have to stop and we have to take a text like verse 18. And we can't just say it. This is one of those texts I have to carry around with me all the time. And I have to memorize it and I have to meditate on it and I have to ask myself constantly, do you think that way, Billy? Do you really think the suffering of this present world is not worthy to be compared with the glory that is soon to be revealed? Do you think that way? Do you value that way? Do you respond that way? Do I stand that way? Do the world, does people around me know that this is what I value? This is how I think. This is the way I, I, I mean, my, my, my whole perspective and value system is set. And so I have to meditate on a verse like this, and then I have to pray. And I have to pray for God to change my heart and allow me to stand for Christ. And we come to the last measure, and it's really one of treasure. I don't know how best to put it other than that. It says if we, Romans, beginning in really that whole section, begin 19, he talks about the creation longing, eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And then in verse 23, that we ourselves, not just creation, but we, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, well, what does that mean? It means if you're a child of God, remember the Spirit of God dwells where? In you. And if the Spirit of God or Spirit of Christ is not in you, then you are none of His, right? So at salvation, the Spirit of life sets us free from the Spirit of sin and death, all right, from the law of sin and death. So the Spirit of life has set me free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death because God has done what God has done, what the law being weakened by the flesh could not do. Through the sending of his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. God saves sinners by means of Christ's sacrifice and he indwells them by the very spirit of life. And so the spirit of God takes up residency and part of the spirit's ministry is to give you an eager longing for something. What? For the day Christ comes again. For the day when our adoption will be complete. For the day when this body will be fully redeemed. You know, in the day I trusted Christ as Savior, I was set free from the penalty of sin. And that day when I bowed my heart and I recognized my sinfulness and God worked graciously in this sinner's life and I turned from sin and said, Lord, I don't want sin to have dominion. I don't want to live in sin. I want to live for you. Thank you for dying for me. And I put my faith and trust in Christ and not in Billy Gocher, not in doing good, not being religious. I put it in Christ. You know what? Then I began to follow Christ. And I begin to live for Christ. I begin to value Christ because he's not only set me free of the penalty of sin, he's working in my life so I'm freed from the power of sin. But you know what he's promised? The day is coming when I'll be free from the presence of sin. And he says all of creation has been affected by this fall. And all of creation longs, he uses a word picture like straining the neck to see something really important. So you're at, the, you know, you're at the race finish line and you're straining to see who's going to cross it first. Are you the first and the first person that gets there when they open the door on Black Friday and you're straining to see where that sale is that you just can't wait to get to? What do you eagerly anticipate? There's not one person in this room that doesn't live in anticipation. Some of you can't wait for this to get done so you can watch your favorite team play their game today. Some people aren't in church today. You know why? Because they couldn't wait. They have to be at a game. Because they're going to go bow to the pigskin idol. Oh, great pigskin idol, give me great pleasure. And cheer, and let me paint up my face and my colors, and go, yay, team! That was a worship event, by the way. The wrong kind. 
Oh, but they love Jesus. Really? You better be really careful how you define the love of Jesus, folks. You better be really careful how you define loving Jesus. We've so paganized loving Jesus, and we live in such a pagan culture, it affects us all the time. What you treasure shows you who your God is. What you treasure, what you value, what you pursue, what you anticipate, tells you who your God is. Now, you live in a culture that feeds your flesh with all the wrong pleasures. So you're going to struggle, and I'm going to struggle with valuing the wrong things. Because I have a flesh that's a traitor. I live in a culture that values the wrong things, and it wants to put out my light by constantly pushing me to anticipate or pursue the things that do not satisfy and do not stand for Christ. What I treasure, I long for, I dream about. It fills my attention, it, it fills my longings, and it causes me to head in a direction. I love the language, the creation waits for the revealing of the sons of God. And I scratch my head a long time going, what exactly is that talking about? And then as you think about it and you come through it, what's going to happen? You know what, there's a lot of people in America that call, call themselves the children of God, right? Do you believe everybody that tells you they're a Christian that they're a Christian? Some of you have family members that have told you they're a Christian, they pray to prayer when they're little, and you're like, I don't think so. Okay, that's a reality for all of us. We all know people like that. Unless you're just, you just sat, you've sat, salved your conscience to the place where you just think anybody who prayed to prayer is going to heaven. I got news for you. That's not biblical. All right? So we all know people who profess to be Christians, and we're like, ah, I, I, no, I, I don't think so. Well, it's just part of the, you know, what's all creation waiting for? Creation's waiting for when God's going to finally reveal who his children really are. God's not confused. We're sometimes confused. And we don't always live like we're the children of God, do we? Again, I could use the illustration borrowed from Christianity Explored. If I followed you around all week long with a camera, and then I actually had the ability to peer in beyond just what you did, but what you actually thought, and recorded it for all week, do you think everything that you did, thought, and said would reveal to others that you're God's child? I seriously doubt it. It wouldn't in my life. Because my flesh still wins battles, and I respond and let my flesh win. And when I do, I sin, and I don't look like God's child. But the good news is, is that day is coming to an end. That day is coming when the revealing of the sons of God, when God is going to finish the work that he began in my life. The day is coming when I will no longer ever deny my Savior or ever live contrary to being his child. The day is coming when I'm going to enjoy my relationship with God, not just a little bit, but fully and forever, without sin. That's a great day, folks. That's what creation longs for, the day when the children of God will be all that God has intended us to be, the work of salvation will be brought to consummation. So creation doesn't just long, the people of God, the children of God long for this. And this is what I ask you today. Where the Spirit of God is leading, there should be a longing in your heart for this to be true. You know, one of the reasons why you struggle weekly so much in your battle against sin, why I struggle in my battle against sin, is I buy into some wrong treasures. And I begin living like, yeah, that's going to happen someday in the future, and that'll be great when it happens. And I dropped it. No, that's good. Sorry. <laughs> so, we'll recapture, maybe. But I begin living like this life is really one of those live for now and tomorrow will take care of itself, right? And I begin buying wrong treasures. When I begin to buy wrong treasures, then I start selling out Christ for temporal comforts. I've been called to live in an eager anticipation, an eager anticipation of the day when this body will be fully redeemed, no longer sinning. And when I live with that anticipation, you know what I, 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 I find? When my life is being lived on a daily basis of anticipation of what Christ is doing and will consummate in glory, then the things of this world stop looking so shiny. They stop having as much appeal in my heart. They stop drawing me away so fast because I don't value it anymore. I don't put that value on that, that object or that new this or being in this place or going on vacation, whatever it is. 
I mean, we have so many idols in American culture, it's not funny. I mean, from materialism to comfort to all kinds of stuff that we value. But the world draws those things and wants me to come over here and just snuff out the light. And how do I keep that from happening? By the Spirit's ministry in my life that produces a longing for the day when I will be without sin. And that means I don't want sin now. I don't want to be entertained by it now. I don't want to be caught up in it now. The day is coming when that battle against sin will be over. The things that we treasure, have, and we dream about, okay, let's get to the next this thing not working. I think I broke it. Let's go to the next slide, please. Sorry. All right. Let's go, we'll go ahead and go past this one if you don't mind. All right. The things we treasure also have the ability to deliver us from present difficulty. And that's what he's talking about here, that the, the, the creation being subject to futility and bondage of corruption. I mean, all he's, he's just dealing with the reality is as, as coming as a product of sin coming to the world, Adam and rebellion. All, we live in a, a sin-cursed world. It's under, the, under a bondage of corruption. And it looks forward to the glorious freedom of the children of God when we'll have a new heaven and a new earth in which sin will never again dwell. This creation is a temporary thing, isn't it? I mean, folks, listen. The world wants to snuff out your light by getting you to value the wrong things, have the wrong treasures. Do you know all those temporal treasures are all going to go away? There's not one of those temporal treasures. I mean, you, you, whatever team that you root for, you know what? Next year, they've got to start a new season, right? Whoever wins the trophy this year has to go back to try and win it next year. And ultimately, all those trophies are going to burn up. No trophy cases in heaven. No medal stands in heaven. No bank accounts in heaven. No cars, no status symbols. None of the stuff the world sticks up and says, you know what? We live in a very rich culture. We do. I know most of you are in this morning going, I'm not rich. What are you talking about? I'm struggling to make ends meet. Well, come with me to Cambodia, and I will show you people who struggle to make ends meet. You do not struggle to make ends meet. You don't know what struggling to make ends meet looks like. Okay? You live in a very wealthy culture, and we treasure that. But we also tend to think that makes us more important than other people. If you don't believe me, go around the world and ask other people what you think about Americans. We tend to think because we live in a wealthy culture, we must be more important or smarter or better. See, we value our treasures. And because we value our treasures, we try and protect them, hold on to them, preserve them, and we're not willing to let them go for Christ. What we dream about, what we treasure, we think is going to solve our problems. So in our culture, we've been taught to treasure money. We've been taught to treasure positions of power. We've been taught to treasure these things because those can solve your problem. I mean, think about it. Why does most people go play the lottery? And if you play the lottery, I'm not asking for personal confession, okay? But most people go play the lottery because they think money will do what? Solve their problem or make them happy, one of the two, or both. Good news for you. They'll do neither. Because the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That's what the Bible actually says. You want to know one of the fundamental reasons why you shouldn't be playing the lottery? Because that verse right there. Because you will love it, and it will destroy you forever. What do we treasure? What do we dream about? What do, how do we organize our life? And here's where, where Paul is going with it. Listen. Listen. All of creation treasures one thing. There's a coming day of redemption when all of this is going to be made right. The suffering is not the final word. Glory is. Glory is the final word, not suffering. Glory forever. And so we're called on to live out the reality of being the children of God. And I'll just put that final slide up if you would. Or Kevin will put the final slide up. And I, I titled the end of the verse, in the, really the last section in verses uh, 24 and 25, he says, In this hope we are saved, and the hope that is not seen, or, or now that hope is seen, I'm sorry, I'll read the verse right. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he has sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. 
The right treasure promised by the right giver is worth waiting for. The right treasure is the coming day in the presence of God that I'm going to enjoy forever. It's been promised by the right giver. The God of heaven has promised that he is accomplishing that in my life and the lives of his children. And that God cannot lie or cannot fail. I can trust him. He has promised that I will have to face suffering for him in this life, but that suffering does not compare to the glory he's about to grant me and to enjoy forever. So I don't bow against suffering. I don't move away from suffering. I embrace Christ and enjoy Christ now because I'm going to enjoy him forever, and whatever that costs me now is okay. Because he's the right giver, and he gives the right promises. He has given the promise of a forever in his presence where I will know fullness of joy. The very purpose for which I was created was not to enjoy the gifts, but the giver. And the day is coming when my heart will no longer be tainted by sin, and my pleasure will be found in the giver and no longer his gifts, and I can't wait for that day to come. But between now and that day, he's called me to be a faithful servant, a soldier who who fights victoriously in a battle, who's willing to suffer for the cause of Christ, to march out not as a victim, but a victor, who is out to take the word of the gospel to all the nations and watch God work to change my life and other lives. And I don't feel sorry for myself, and I don't look at suffering as something to be avoided. I have Christ. What do I have to feel sorry for? I don't want people to feel sorry for me. I'm not looking for pity. I'm not looking for sympathy. I'm looking for opportunity to declare Christ. Because my Savior is worth it, and I'm worthy to suffer whatever may come for the sake of my Savior. Is that where we are? Because if we're not, we don't have the right treasure, we haven't trusted the right giver, and we're not willing to wait for it. The day is coming when all of that treasure that Christ has promised will be richly enjoyed, and that will be enjoyed forever. And guess what? We're not going to be digging up the streets of gold and putting them in our pocket and taking them to a bank. We're not going to be go and pull out that pearl out of the gate and the sapphire and the foundation stones and say, isn't that going to make a great ring? I am not going to be in the kingdom going, isn't this fun? I'm going to be serving my Savior without sin. And I will know joy, not fun. There's a big difference between joy and fun. And if you haven't figured that out yet, you're still very immature. The day is coming when fullness of joy and pleasure forevermore will be experienced by the children of God. And until that day arrives, I've been called to patiently wait for it. In fact, Paul in the gospel, and in Paul in 1 Thessalonians, the first gospel, first letter that he wrote, describes their conversion as that they turned to God from idols and began serving God, no longer serving idols. And it's a great picture as he paints there. There's faith and there's repentance. There's turning away from the idols of the heart, away from the idolatry of the culture. There's turning to God in dependence. How do we know that? They serve God. And then he comes and he says, and to wait for the Son from heaven. You see, the Spirit of God produces a longing in the hearts of God's children for heaven. You know, this Saturday we get to celebrate the homegoing of Chuck. And I can tell you this honestly, as I met with him many times in the last days of his life, Chuck was looking forward to heaven. He had a growing longing for heaven that he could not wait. Go over and see some of our shut-ins. Go over and see Ruby Fleeman. And sometimes Ruby puts it in a frame of complaint. I can't, why is God leaving me here? I'm not good for anything. And we talk about that. But you know what really she's saying? She's saying, I can't wait to get to heaven. I'm tired of this. I'm ready for heaven. I am so ready for heaven. And folks, isn't it a shame that so often we have to get to the place where our physical bodies have failed us before we're there? It shouldn't be that way. 
And the only reason why it gets that way, and I'm not saying that was that way for Ruby, I'm just saying we live in a culture that's taught us to value temporal fun to the place that we don't long for heaven. We long for the here and now stuff, and we put out the light of the gospel because of it. Long for heaven. There is no such thing as somebody is too heavenly minded to be earthly good. That does not exist. If you are really heavenly minded, you're going to do this earth a whole lot of good. What do you treasure? Who's your father? Whose child are you? The Bible offers us the evidences, and the question is, is are the evidences compelling in your life or not? If they're compelling, it's because the Spirit of God is at work producing that fruit in your life for which you rejoice and thank God for it. If it's not compelling, then you need to deal with it. Why is it not compelling? The evidence. What sin is blocking your fellowship with God and enjoying the testimony of the Spirit? What sin is blocking right now your longing for heaven? What is it? God knows. Will God not show you? He will. Will God not forgive you? Listen, Jesus died for that sin that's blocking your fellowship with him, didn't he? Jesus died for all of them. And he calls you to come and confess them, and he will cleanse you and restore you in fellowship. Or the issue is if you have no, I mean, if that's not you, there's no compelling evidence. And the question is, have you ever trusted Christ? Does the Spirit of God dwell in you? Have you really experienced new life, or is it just a little bit of religion? Folks, a little bit of religion takes no one to heaven. It takes all those people to hell. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ by means of the Spirit that testifies to our heart and produces evidence. So examine the evidence today. Test yourself. See if you be in the faith. And if you are, you have so much to rejoice in. And if you're not certain today, don't leave here in that position of uncertainty. Settle the issue with Christ. He died for you. He will welcome you. Come, be forgiven. Be reconciled to God and enjoy God now and forever. Would you do that? Let's pray. Father, we wrestle through these realities and try to bring them to bear as best we can. There's so, so much here. And Father, I confess that we, we live, I live, in a world that has turned so many value systems upside down that causes me at times far more often than I ever like to confess to move life towards my own comforts and conveniences rather than towards sacrifice and discomfort or suffering. And Father, all we can do is acknowledge that and ask your forgiveness and that the Spirit might have greater leadership in our life, that we could truly consider the sufferings of this life not worthy of comparison to the glory that will soon be enjoyed by the children of God forever. Lord, help me not to sacrifice those things that are eternal on the altar of the temporal. Help me not to put out the light of the gospel for the approval of men. Lord, help me not to yield, help us not to yield to our flesh and buy into the trinkets of this world and compromise the glory of another. Lord, help us to stand, to stand for Christ, to show to a world who values all the wrong things the worth of Christ, the supreming, surpassing value, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Lord, may that be shown in our life, may it be shown as that which we truly treasure. Father, when we treasure Christ, we treasure you right, then we're prepared to stand in the midst of suffering and even to rejoice when we suffer for your namesake. Lord, do a gracious work in hearts today. Prepare our hearts. Cleanse our hearts. Restore in many the joy of salvation and help those today who need to be saved to come to Christ. Heads are bowed and